So hello everybody, I'm Luca Leonte and I'll be your host for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. The topic that we have planned to cover is one of the most critical aspects of Agile transformations. Everyone is pretty aware of the basic Agile team setup and we know that uh, the implementation of Agile practices has unlocked value and has opened new ways of doing things and at the same time has increased the uh, overall speed for building and delivering new products. We also know that in the light of these uh, successes, the immediate item that came on everybody's mind was how do we scale this? How do we manage to run multiple teams in parallel? How do we keep all the communication and collaboration that Agile has brought us without falling back to old practices? And most importantly, how do we build a framework that unlocks additional value and further increases our speed of delivery at a larger scale, a scale demanded by today's organizations? Now, there have been many proposals for scaling Agile and out of the many ideas uh, there, that there are out there, a few got traction and started to emerge as standards of scaling Agile. Needless to say that not all attempts for scaling Agile have been successful. So tonight we will um, do a deep dive into one of the frameworks that have been very successful and have been accepted by the industry as a standard for uh, scaling Agile. Our guest speaker will um, take us on a journey to explore the less framework and uh, to look at the good things to consider when scaling Agile using less and the usual pitfalls that we should avoid in the process. Now, before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like to cover a bit of the logistics of this webinar. The session will be divided into section, the main presentation and uh, a Q&A section at the end. If you have any questions during this uh, session, please type your questions into the chat box and we will try to cover them uh, during the Q&A session. All right, so to speak a bit about our guest speaker tonight, uh, Jean Janelle is an Agile coach and trainer that has over 15 years of experience uh, with helping companies of various sizes to improve their internal dynamics, their organizational structure, and become a better place to work and to thrive through the implementation of Agile practices. Now, Gene is a Scrum Alliance certified Agile coach and is one of the small elite of certified enterprise coaches. And uh, he is also one of the very few certified less trainers in the US. So tonight he will cover uh, exclusively for the members of the Expert Agile Club, the topic of scaling Agile using the less framework. Gene, thank you very much for being here with us tonight. I'll now hand it over to you for the presentation. All right, since uh, you gave the uh, the uh, the intros, I will help. I will happily skip this page. <laughs> it's gonna be in the slides. If you want to share with the audience, you, yep. you I'm happy to to provide it to you. Um, the only thing I'm gonna say is that I've been uh, uh, working um, in in the capacity of a trainer and coach and over design consultant for almost close to 15 years out of my 20 plus years of paid career uh and less has been uh, my uh one of my heaviest tools in my toolbox for the last decade or so uh even before um less has become known as less framework which was in 20 um 2015 uh there are many experiments that i have been trying and using with teams and organizations okay so um just a little bit of um uh, preface about what less is and um, I'm just going to use a bit of history that is not potential may not be apparent to everyone. Uh, well, let's does have history, unlike other commercial frameworks that you may know. And this is definitely not about bashing or scolding anything else that's out there. Of course, I'm, I welcome questions, but uh, this is really about really not about that. It's about just giving you a very candid uh intel inside about less being historically known for 
uh, many experiments and experiences that have been documented very thoroughly. Uh, in fact, the very first last book came out in 2008, and it was followed by another book in 2010. And the first two books actually concentrated on experiments, in-depth uh, description uh, dives into various types of experiments. Um, it is only in 2016 when the third book, uh, we call it the Green Book, was released, and it covered the actual principles and frameworks. So the first two were focused on experiments and guides, and the second um, and the third book was on principles and frameworks. And uh, if you ever choose to read uh, thoroughly about large-scale Scrum, uh, I would recommend starting with the Green Book because it's uh, more concise and more it's it's more uh, it's a more natural way to learn to study less. Uh, once you understand the um, principles and the frameworks, also the frameworks are referred to as rules, uh, and it will be much easier to absorb uh, guides and experiments. One thing it's more it's important to understand is this: large scale Scrum was not a commercial product, and um, it's not to be confused with anything that may be out there very successful, very widespread, very uh, you know very commonly unpacked and install. And uh, of course, we often have to answer this question, what's the success rate of less large scale scrum? What's the depth of market penetration? And it will be not even close uh, for a while, at least, it will not be um, even close to the uh, brand name recognition uh, of some other, uh, well, let me rephrase that. Brand name recognition, you may actually know um you may have as as time goes by but uh we don't expect too many organizations to just unpack and install large scale scrum because as an organizational design framework it is uh meant to uh change uh, systemically improve organizational design and uh, in order to sign up for such as endeavor um companies really need to be ready and we need uh, very strong support, not in spirit, uh, by senior management, and more to say on that front just in the upcoming slides. So there's something that we all need to understand, and this, 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 this entire talk will be framed in the form of do's and do nots, uh, based on uh, my personal experience, uh, experience, as well as some of the documented experiences from the field. And by the way, as I mentioned, we have 600 plus experiments documented, okay, and they're all publicly available, free. Unless that works out, if you're interested, I can share with you those um, assets, those links. Well, this is something that uh, not very clear to people sometimes, and we need to, uh, and requires an explanation. Organizational design is the first order factor or variable, as we refer to it, that is um, responsible for the ecosystemic dynamics. Organizational design is the first order variable that has impact and everything else inside the, inside of your organizational ecosystem. Everything else um, follows culture, mindset, behaviors, norms, values, you name it. Uh, we oftentimes see uh, less um, experienced folks, uh, coaches, you know, they call themselves coaches and uh, other agile uh, evangelists, you know, entrepreneurs, enthusiasts. There, there are many words out there that describe you guys, there, there's some static there. Perhaps maybe people can put themselves on mute if they don't speak. Luca, do you have control of that? And maybe you can unmute me. Hey, Pip, Pip. I was actually on mute myself, so. Oh, it's okay. It's just some funny static, so funny uh, feedback was in my computer. Yeah. So anyway, uh, okay. yeah? Uh, may I continue? Please go. Yes, sure. Yeah, so we actually have to set the record straight. Uh, we recognize the importance of all of the listed below. It's just those are not the first order factors that we need to pay attention to. And uh, less uh, uh, conscious um, organizational attempts to change agility, uh, organizational agility for better, um, less conscious ones start with those that are listed in italic fonts here without actually looking um, into the organizational design and trying to fix that. 
I'm going to steal this quote from one of the co-founders of Watch Tales From, someone I know for many years and respect, and also who is my personal mentor, has been my personal mentor on many occasions, Craig Larman. This is the quote from his uh, personal writing back in 2015, uh, when he wrote on, on the Scrum Alliance website. And as a matter of fact, Scrum Alliance uh, is probably one of the most reputable, the most reputable body that has, uh, you know, has to say what coaching is and what it's not. And uh, large scale Scrum is recognized framework by, it's a preferred and, and endorsed framework by the Scrum Alliance. Um, the word endorsed, maybe not the right word, but it, it is what uh, it's recommended by the Scrum Alliance. But in any case, uh, the, the focus here is on what uh, Craig is saying here. You can't really expect organizational agility just by focusing on technology only. Yeah, sure, you can improve um, some engineering practices, uh, you know, some do some stuff that is very important on, um, at IT level, like test-driven development, CI, CD pipeline creation, test, test cut coverage. Um, but at the same time, it is just a, one layer of a sushi roll. And this is my analogy. If you like sushi, you don't want to eat just the seaweed, right? You want to cut across and eat the entire stack of, uh, of, of, of uh, ingredients. So the same thing with an organization, apply the sushi roll concept. In order to change your organization for better and make it more agile, you have to touch many organizational dimensions that are not very popular these days still. For many organizations, we uh, see avoidance or, you know, our organizations put visors on and uh, don't want to think, oh shoot, we need to actually look at HR policies and product management and legal practices as well. Yes, they do. Yes, you do. You should. Uh, so, what does it really take us to move uh, forward with uh, less adoption? Well, first, at multiple organizational layers, levels, and especially at senior management level, we want to get an informed consent. What is an informed consent, folks? Uh, some of you may have some legal background. Um, if you don't, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, informed consent is your uh, acknowledgement of the, of the fact uh, that you are up against something and you uh, are very conscious and, and, and clear on what you uh, are going to encounter, what you're going to proceed towards. And of course, um, we want your mature, conscious acknowledgement of that. We don't necessarily uh, want this in writing, but uh, of course, uh, you know, it's all gentlemen's agreements, if you will. But when we ask an organization to go and to consider less adoption, we strongly recommend getting uh, senior management's informed consent that they do understand what it's going to take to take their organization through agile adoption. Why, you may ask? Well, because uh, large-scale Scrum requires organizational improvements, organizational design improvements that can only be done um, at, with consent and, and strong support of senior management. Not support in spirit and slogans and, you know, um, as we refer to those town hall, fireside chat statements. Um, we actually want them uh, to do this in action by doing Gemba. Uh, what's called Genshu Gambutsu, uh, going to the trenches, going down deep, deep down below to where action is and actually helping out. So that's pretty important. Okay. So next one is um, the three very uh, important, three key principles of less adoption. Deep and narrow, as opposed to broad and shallow. Top down and bottom up, as opposed to just one, top down or bottom up. And using volunteering principle as opposed to command and control, a prescription, uh, condescending um, by enforcement, okay? What does it really mean if we were to decipher this? Deep and narrow means we uh, want our agile or less adoption to be deep enough that it cuts across multiple organizational domains, uh, multiple organizational, um, uh, what's the right word there, I guess, layers, uh, the previous slide from Craig's, um, the, the snippet talked about HR, legal practices, site strategies, vendor management. Yes, all of those. So we need to touch upon all of those disciplines. Uh, but at the same time, we're not trying to 
you know, blow the entire organization out of the sky and, and flip it all at once. So large scale scrum um, product group is around 70 people, give or take, two to eight teams, three to nine people per team. So if you do the math, you'll come up with the number about 70 or so. So deep and narrow as opposed to bird and shallow. And the next slide will kind of you know, compare and contrast the two. A top down and bottom up means we want to spend enough time with senior management to teach them, to coach them, to uh, make them understand what it actually entails to change uh, their organizational design for better. And of course, uh, we want to give a lot of training and coaching to individuals and teams at the gra at ground level. And uh, usually it takes just a couple of months to do prep work before you flip your organization, uh, you know, to flip a switch uh, and up to eight teams start sprinting all together. Now, uh, to in order to work with your senior management, in order to work with the senior management, you oftentimes need, uh, need to bring in an external um, expert, someone who is really equipped with knowledge and expertise and, and track record of handling these tough, uh, sometimes very provocative and um, uh, I would say <laughs> not popular topics, right? Um, career development, uh, perks and bonuses, uh, reporting structure, things that are, may not necessarily be uh, comfortable to be handled by uh, internal people. And uh, we oftentimes see internal coaches just are not able to handle it, not because they don't understand, it's because they are not comfortable to step out of their comfort zone to address these matters. And of course, last but not least, we want to use a volunteering principle for this. Now, we use volunteering at multiple uh, levels. Um, when we pick a product to be uh, developed in the future going forward by using less, we use a volunteering approach. We can't force it upon a product group. We cannot force it upon product managers. We look for, for a place within an organization where we can find a product, either internal or maybe externally facing, that is best suitable for this uh, less adoption for less adoption and it's all very experimental so we want to look for something that is important enough but not mission critical unless this mission critical in such a bad state at the moment that nothing could be worse than it then we can uh, experiment with less so it's different by volunteering and we also use volunteering when we uh, let people out of less product group because they don't want to be a part of less adoption uh, we can't uh, force people we cannot chain them to chairs and we can uh, allow people to step in and become a part of less product group if they want to be. Some people are very excited to become a part of less product group. So that's a volunteering aspect. And of course, there is a lot of volunteering that's happening uh, in the interim throughout, um, um, you know, less adoption. And of course, at tactical, at team level, there's a lot of volunteering when you assign work to yourselves, when you do other things, which we probably can spend many, many hours discussing, right? So those are the three things. Uh, those are the three principles that are very important in, in less adoption. Here's a little illustration of a, you know, it's a compare and con uh, contrast, right? Uh, on the right-hand side, you see a deep and narrow, uh, bottom up and top down um, adoption. That's, that is less. We're looking at organizational structure, HR policies, site strategies, vendor management, all these are very important, very deep systemic things. And by the way, we're not just trying to reinvent the wheel and we're not aliens. These are the things that define organizational dynamics. And those companies that, are, that trivialize it, they probably will have a very superficial way of um, you know, dealing with, uh, with, with Agile. And those coaches that kind of dismiss the need of looking at these are probably not um, experienced enough. On the left-hand side, though, we see what we often see. Uh, we see best practices, cookbooks, tools, operating models, racks, KPIs, metrics, various maturity levels, velocities. Yes, those are the things that we may potentially um, entertain. These are not completely wasteful. Some of them are pretty good if they come from right people for right reasons. But if this is the only, if this is the only focal point for agile transformation, you would expect this very uh, shallow and probably very broad because they want to flip the whole org once and, and you know, uh, claim a bunch of credits and you know, do the check boxes. If we see this, uh, most likely you're going to go through this cycle 
of, uh, of, of, of uh, system gaming and, and and we'll call it agile theater or masquerade that will probably come to halt to a halt in, a, in maybe in a few months, maybe in a few years, without much um, uh, without much of, of value uh, brought to uh, to the company. Uh, there's another aha moment for many, and please understand this: less is not many teams doing their own scrum. It is less is many teams scrumming together on the same product. So this is it. This is less. Multiple horses together pulling the same horse carriage in the same direction for the same goal for the same purpose this is not less you may have five six a hundred great performing teams scrum teams you know chasing in different direction that, that that would not be true scaling in fact we don't recommend to scale unless you absolutely have to if you can get away with it, you have a bunch of small products uh, that are truly distinctly different do not try to scale and lap, lump them together into some fake portfolio. Let those scrum teams to be independent. However, I would always say question and challenge, what do you call a product today? Most likely what you call a product today is not a product, it's a component of a product. And it's very deep systemic. System, there is a systemic, deep systemic reason why this is the case. Oftentimes it's because of organizational structures and reporting structures that are archaic and historical and protective enough um you know pr protecting of individual turfs like you know a component man uh, a, con a component manager or a component lead wants to protect their turf so in any case back to my point on the left you have uh, an analogy of of less on the right you have an analogy of uh, maybe even scrum maybe even a healthy feature centric development by individual uh, independent teams but not less now I'm going to give you a few words of caution, and this is something that you absolutely have to. This is do's and do nots, right? Especially when you um, look for people for your less adoption. You look for quality people. You look for uh, well seasoned, well versed, experienced developers. You're not looking for second, third class citizens. You're not looking for people that are uh, not high enough quality. You're not looking for cheap resources, and therefore. By all costs, by all means, you have to avoid uh, anything that has to do with this problem. And we see this more often than not. This is the problem I refer to as the middleman problem, right? You have uh, consultancies and agencies that sit in between uh, very uh, low skilled individuals uh, playing the role of intermediaries and uh, matchmakers. Try to uh, cut them out as much as you can. And I'm going to be very blunt and very direct in my recommendation. If you are, if you work for an organization, if you're part of an organization, and you need to procure quality people, do your own work. Maybe you find uh, one, two, or three, a handful of senior and well-versed uh, independent um, recruiters. Bring them on site. Uh, place them uh, internally within the walls of your organization, virtual or physical, and make them do the legwork. And most importantly, make sure your people, your own people, your own employees, vet those people that will be joining their teams. Not managers, not HR first, and not most definitely not external vendor companies. Another big do not be very mindful of uh, situ with, uh, of situations where you have large consultancies, oftentimes being supported by those small recruiting firms. Um, offering you big bang agile transformation solutions that cost a gazillion of dollars. Uh, they usually come in tandem in conjunction with um, agile, quote unquote, tools uh, that are also supportive of those big bang transformations. And of course, very large commercial successful frameworks. I refer to this as a triple taxation problem, triple taxation on a, on a, com on a client company. So if you work for a company, be mindful of it. Um, this is a big do not for um, agile improvements in general, and most uh, definitely for less adoption. My next slide would be probably very similar to the previous one in the sense that if you're looking uh, for quality assets, people are not resources, people are, um, people are humans, right? Uh, please be mindful of this very classic, very, a uh, very challenging problem out there. You got a huge resource pool, right? These, all these dark uh, folks are 
uh, you know, the dark color uh, are, you know, just people, right? And they may claim, they may claim that they are coaches. This is an, ex an example of procuring uh, coaching uh, expertise into your company. There could be some great, um, you know, folks that they're, they're, they're colored in green, uh, some great um, specialists and great, uh, you know, you know, great, well-rounded and experienced coaches. However, they're so hard to find in this big mishmash of, 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 of people. And this, this is the uh, problem. We, I talk to many companies and uh, many companies r r recognize this problem, but they don't do much to fix the problem. Uh, here's a client company that re is reliant on large consultancies that have second, third hand procurement mechanism to bring in these cheap um, resources and uh, staff them into a client company. Of course, with this kind of quality, you get uh, poor quality of coaching and training. So if you want to uh, go to less adoption, of course, do not uh, follow this, um, th 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 this, this approach. In fact, no matter what you do, try to avoid doing that. Try to hire, try to find your own people. Uh, with uh, speaking, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm deep going a little bit on the coaching aspect because uh, you do have to have a very experienced coaches and um, especially in large scale scrum, uh, a scrum master is a full time role. So you need to have very seasoned people, very seasoned people. You can't find you cannot look for leftover people or people that are not up to par. So I am actually, I have coined this statement and hopefully it will put some a smile on your face. There's a great thing we call the test driven, um, test driven development, DDT, right? The TDD. But at the same time, when you have organizations going through what's called deck driven transformations, that's a very good sign that they got it wrong. We oftentimes see we oftentimes see this approach uh, of transforming when an organization hires a large consultancy, costs a gazillion of dollars. You usually end up with a very uh, expensive deck, but very little um, collateral uh, value to it. Um, another statement I'm going to say here: Do not and do 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 not. So if you want to bring in uh, quality assets to your company. Uh, and this is super important for less adoption because we are looking, we always rely on quality people. We can't, um, this may sound like a cliche, hey, hey, we always want quality people, but if we do not uh, stress the importance of quality, like unless we, we cannot um, allow people that are not willing to learn and are not willing to uh, absorb no, more knowledge and are not willing to teach others. So we look for best of the best and match them with the best of the best. Um, and specifically on the subject of coaching here, it also is very important. We want people that are pretty um, well seasoned. So you cannot really um, expect too much seasoning from a person on the red hand side, the, the, the red person, right? Uh, we call this uh, you know, a, career, um, a career climber who uh, jumps from the old role into some new role and uh, looks for uh, agile as a as a fast track to um, ex you know ex expand their career, but really without much investment into it. And we oftentimes see this problem with companies that uh, deal with people. Um, well, your role is, is is may not necessarily be any longer used because we are becoming more agile. You have been doing project management for <clears throat> for X number of years, and you <clears throat> you have been assigning tasks to other people. We're kind of going away with that. We're going to be using Scrum, or we may, we might be even using less. So what are you going to do? Well, you have to give them an opportunity to do something. Well, instead of actually going through the learning process, these people just jump on the bandwagon and look at uh, look for uh, agile as a fast track to uh, just. Uh, to propagate their career, maybe for a year or two, then they jump off that bandwagon and do something else. So you definitely don't want people on the left, on the right hand side. You want these little blue men on the left hand side that actually take this journey very seriously and, and go through this um, advancement ladder, uh, personal growth ladder, step by step, and help each other up. Um, of course, if you are in pursuit of a career as a coach, you want to be uh, on the left hand side, uh, not on the right hand side. Uh, this is more of a 
skip through slide. Of course, certifications are there. Uh, we do not care about certifications uh, in, uh, in people. We, we do not care about certifications when we look for people for less adoptions. We do not care uh, if someone has been certified, uh, but you know, we, we actually attest for knowledge. If it's a developer, we're gonna look for uh, specific uh, skills, technical skills. If it's a scrum master, we will really have to uh, check um, his mindset and his seasoning by putting them in uh, various situations, by giving them case studies. So we don't care about these um, you know, fake certifications. And, and there are many out there, so this is almost like our, um, an additional recommendation to you. Be mindful of what's available out there because this industry has become so commoditized lately. There's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, for less specifically, uh, we want very seasoned scrum masters. So as much as we, and we clearly need an organization that is supportive of agile roles, specifically the role of a scrum master. So this is uh, one of my uh, other cartoons. And as you probably already noticed, I like uh, addressing organizational problems uh, with sarcasm and jokes. So this is my, one, one of my ways to do it. So here's one. Uh, this, this is a bad SQL. You don't want this SQL to be ran against your HR database, right? Especially the second statement where it relates to uh, less. Uh, actually, the second and the third relate a lot. You don't want to just take a junior project manager who is looking for a career change and assign a role of a Scrum Master to him in large-scale Scrum. Because in large-scale Scrum, that person should be very well-seasoned, uh, should be very intimately familiar with basic Scrum, and also have uh, some experience with uh, uh, large-scale Scrum. And of course, that requires some time, right? We, you can't just pull someone off, you know, off the street or take your existing person who is looking for a different career, give them a different title. Same thing goes for a product owner. You, do, you don't just take your business analyst uh, who wants to become a project manager, a product manager now, and you, you know, relabel him overnight and say, well, now you're, you're going to be a product owner for Team X. In fact, we strongly disc. It is against less rules to have uh, one product owner per team. In, la in, in large scale Scrum, we have up to eight teams supported by one product owner. Uh, I'm going to skip over this one. So here's another example. Avoid this. This is, I've jokingly referred to this as pragmatic Scrum. This is a an example of a company not wanting to empower their product owner, product owner enough so that he or she can do the job and be directly interfacing with the team. This is another uh, strong anti-pattern. It's a big dysfunction. Um, I call it pragmatic Scrum, quote unquote. Uh, in large scale Scrum, we want a real product owner who is facing face to face with the team. And there are some recommendations what, where to go and where to look for, uh, for the right product owner and how to define uh, his or her uh, interaction points with the team as well as with the stakeholders. Okay. Um, here is a do and, um, actually, this is a do and do not at the same time. It's a slightly uh, overloaded slide, but in large scale Scrum, we want coaches to be deeply embedded with teams and lateral to one another. We don't want any coaching horror. So what you see here, uh, I'm sorry, what you see here on the uh, right-hand side, this is what we would expect from a, from, from a less like organization. This, was, uh, this slide was not created explicitly for less, but it, it's very uh, less friendly, if you will. These coaches are coaching, they're close with these teams, and there are some other teams, but you don't want any hierarchy amongst the coaches. You expect these coaches to be on par with each other, all senior and, and uh, uh, versatile enough to work together as a community. Of course, with a short catwalk to senior leadership. Here, um, you obviously have uh, what's referred to as a, the power power, the country club of centralized coaches, people that uh, least likely have experience as coaches, most likely have been, um, you know, you XPMO, X, X managers that now have jumped on a bandwagon of coaching and they are doing the whole thing. They're setting best practices. They're setting up statistics, maturity metrics, 
much of uh, lots of lots of wiki pages box notes reports bodies of knowledge just stuff that is very trivial in in a true agile organization and they spend very little time with um individual teams um this is another example of what we do not see in large-scale SRAM adoption. It's a little noisy there. So that's another example. Uh, we care not about meaningless metrics. If there are any metrics, they should be very meaningful and should be, they should be coming from the teams themselves. Now, if you see this sort of um, uh, dysfunction, most likely, uh, your organization is not really trying to become any more agile. They are trying to check the boxes and probably even people that are in a more senior position, they're also trying to check the boxes. Uh, when you have an organization setting some sort of a agile, agile maturity level, which is uh, facetiously, ironically, you know, many numbers after the decimal point and, you know, year end of maturity per percentage, it turns into a, I know, a, the game of numbers, the chasing numbers game. numbers game. And we definitely want to avoid it at all costs because uh, there's some echo. Uh, because, you know, oftentimes it's fueled by the desire to chase some bonuses and rewards. And if you see this happening, uh, it's a good telltale sign the organization is not really taking agility seriously. Um, this is one of, my, one of my favorite ones. I call it Scrum Blind Date. It's very applicable to less. I call it Scrum Blind Date. It's very applicable to less. Uh, uh, there's a lot of echo, folks. I'm not sure why this is happening. I think there was somebody that uh, was unmuted. I just muted. Yeah, yeah. it's gone now. It's okay. So uh, we very explicitly and very methodically train and coach uh people to become uh to be scrum masters and product owners and people that come into less um product groups are, are very uh, well versed uh, well trained and coached already because we have a runtime before we actually flip the switch into less so having um this um masquerade as we call it is not acceptable so try to avoid it at all costs uh, just relabeling a project manager into a scrum master and a business analyst into a product owner will not be uh, sufficient um, in any way, shape, or form. In fact, it will be very harmful for basic scrum, let alone for large-scale scrum. Think of it this way. Anything that cause, causes a dysfunction in basic scrum, uh, when multiplied uh, by tenfold, that's what you actually expect. Uh, if you consider what it would look like in less, it's not a linear, it's a superlinear uh, relationship. Uh, do not copy paste existing uh, so-called operating models, or some people for, for some reason think it's a framework. Uh, it, it has never been. I'm not going to drop the name of it, but I'm sure you can recognize what it is. Chapters of chapters, tribes of tribes, guilds squads it's a heavily overloaded terminology uh there was a very strong sentiment from the creators of this thing in the beginning that a decade ago the gentleman by name henrik nyberg who in fact introduced uh, these concepts uh, along with some other colleagues did it for the for the team of 50 60 people and he strongly recommends not to copy paste but there are many companies many many companies that have have gone the wrong path and uh, unfortunately, the problem is also fueled by large consultancies that actually um, recommend this approach, which is obviously very harmful, dysfunctional. And if that's not enough for you, super expensive. Okay. So, of course, if you uh, are in the organizational setting where this is happening, uh, chances of, well, let me put it this way, your chances of challenging these functions by understanding less are extremely high because less uh, experiments and less principles are very um, you know very powerful if you understand them so you can actually un uh, you know unpack a lots of dysfunction lots of problems that reside with it within this picture and this is probably a nice clone of 
uh, majority of what, what the majority of companies do today. When they unpack and install, they just say, okay, well, we'll take our existing uh, verticals, we're gonna flip them on their side, we're gonna call them chapters. Now, if it's big enough, we're gonna call it a chapter of chapters. We're gonna take an existing, uh, you know, poorly staffed, uh, used to be a group, now it's called a squad. We call it, we're, gonna call, we're gonna call it a, a squad now. It's, a, it's based off component experts, uh, only of one component. It's really not a cross-functional uh, feature-centric uh, team. So uh, there's a lot of dysfunction in terminology overloading. Uh, this is a repeating slide. So here's an important thing for you to remember. In large-scale Scrum, uh, unlike uh, simple Scrum, basic Scrum, when you have only one team, small team working on a small product for, a sm for one product owner, in large-scale Scrum, a Scrum Master is a full-time job. It's a full-time role. I like calling it a job because if you do it full-time, it's you know you get paid for it, so that's your job. And it does not go away over time. Uh, in fact, as time goes by, a Scrum Master's focus will change. It will change from uh, coaching uh, a product owner and teams and doing some of the organizational pre-design efforts that would subside uh, once you flip your switch into less. That over time goes down, but what increases is a focus on development practices. And then shortly thereafter, shortly the, the, the initial flip switch uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, to, a, to a less product group, then again, Focus, uh, the focus on organizational design starts growing. So we are looking for a very, as I mentioned a few times before, we're looking for a very seasoned, very well-versed uh, individual who is, um, you know, who has gone through proper training, proper vetting, has been around the block multiple times, and who can support up to three teams uh, in the form of coaching. So, um, you know, if think of it this way, if you have an eight team product group, less product group, you may have uh, as many as eight Scrum Masters if each Scrum Master supports only one team. If it's a very complex situation, like maybe very complex product and many organizational frictions, but it could be less than that. It could be as little as three Scrum Masters, each one supporting up to three teams, so it's three, three, and two. But this is a very important role. This is a well, first very seasoned person it's a team level coach do not trivialize it do not marginalize it do not make it less important than it is if your organization is trying to make it uh, like a hobby kind of thing um it will, it will create some serious challenges for that person uh, this is right from the last site from large scale scrum site do not put your leftover people in this role just because someone is being misplaced because they're no longer doing ba work or pm work don't just throw them into the role of a Scrum Master, especially not in less. Okay, it's a full-time role. And of course, for this, your organization needs to be uh, very supportive of uh, Scrum Master career path. In HR database table, there's gotta be an, uh, a role of a Scrum Master and it should not, should not be um, someone just, you know, relabeled from the old role to the new role because that's what they pay grid says, eh, roughly, at this level, this person should become a Scrum Master. That's a very wrong approach to go. Uh, Larman's Laws of Organizational Behavior, please remember those. Um, first and the second one, talk about first and second line management usually becoming um, a challenge and, and, and a resistor to uh, anything that wants to be off change. So it's almost like you know, anything, anything that is about to improve your organization and requires rocking the place, rocking the boat, may find resistance within that, uh, within this layer, this echelon of power, which, which isn't much power just because of the quality of people there, it creates uh, some uh, significant resistance. And corollary to number one and two, number three, anything that's truly, um, you know, requires a real change requires a real improvement will be called purist theoretical not pragmatic enough too dogmatic uh, too uh too unrealistic even religious right and uh i mentioned number number four law actually describes uh some of the serious challenges that we see with with the coaching profession and that's what we have described uh in the previous slides 
So this is called, the, and by the way, the number five says culture follows structure. And going back to the previous statement I made, you, you absolutely must care about the culture, but do not think of uh, that culture will change on its own. You know, especially like take a look at all of us. We are well, uh, well versed, seasoned, mature people. For us to change our culture and behaviors without changing the ecosystem we work in, it's pretty um, pretty unrealistic. So it's the structure that supports and surrounds us that's going to dictate how we be behave, how we treat each other. Um, yeah, so that's that. And it's called, uh, these are called Larman's Laws of organiza uh, Organizational Behavior. Craig Larman is the one of the co-founders of Large Scale Scrum, if that helps. Right, so uh, unless we definitely do not want um, Theory X management, uh, I recommend this book if you have a chance to read it by uh, Douglas McGregor, uh, The Human Side of Enterprise. Effectively, the theory X, uh, theory X says that humans are lazy bastards they are not good humans. They really, they need someone to stand over them with a, you know, two by four baseball bat and force them to work because they are lazy. They like to cheat. They like to you know, sneak out. They, they just don't work. They, they don't like working hard. Uh, and it's a very depressed culture. Whereas the green side, the, the theory way says, hey, management should be supportive of their people. They should give them the, an opportunity to do something great and step back. People are entrepreneurs. People are philanthropists. People are um, self-propelled if you let them do it. Just step back and give them space. And of course, the carrot and stick approach here on, in the uh, bottom right corner is aligned with the theory X. That's not what we want in less. In less, we, in fact, we don't have any managers. If managers exist, their role is to change. I'm not talking about senior management. I'm talking about first, second line management. You know, less is a self-organization, large-scale scrum, is up to eight scrum teams, self-formed, self-organized, self-managed, okay, self-sustainable. Uh, my, I think it's my last slide here, so I'm going to give you a quick compare and contrast and introduce the notion of local optimization. Uh, local optimization is something that we teach a lot in depth uh, in various forms um, in, in less training. Local optimization, optimization is something that we need to learn how to see and hear. And once we do, it's almost impo impossible to unsee it. You cannot unlearn this thing. Uh, local optimization as opposed to system optimization, it's not a good thing. It is effectively, what it means is that we are op local optimized for the sake of our own existence and our own success at expense of organizational systemic success. Here's an example of local optimization uh, in the team structure. Uh, a component team is a locally optimized team structure. Why? A component team effectively is a team that works just on one uh, system component, such as a UI, UX, or a business logic, or database. Imagine these three teams, A, B, and C. Now, team A works on a component A. From a standpoint of a product owner, it's a high priority item. Guess what? The team B, component team B, can, al can also do this um, item, which is pretty nice. But now there's some integration going on between the two teams because each team is dependent on the other team. Now, team C cannot work on either one or two or three. Team C can only work on item number four. If, um, if Anthony or Len were product owners, they would be very upset that there was a team that was working on something that was not high enough in priority on their list. So that would be actually not a good thing. Like for me as a product owner, I'm, I'm optimized for the better, uh, for, the, for the goodness of, the, of an entire company or my, my product is a, it's a, it's a, it's a system optimized goal is, is to improve my product. But at the same time, I have some teams, of, we just have three teams here on the, on the graphic, but you can have multiple teams working on items in the backlog that are very low, that, that deep down below. Now, what does it really mean? Component team C works very hard and they're very effective in developing a component C. And there could be many more items like four or five and 10 that are component C centric. They, whereas they're working very hard and they seem to be very e efficient, they're working on stuff that is trivial. They are sub-optimized systemically. They are locally optimized for their own goodness. And that's something that we see a lot. Um, a business analyst will be very successful in writing many, many, many requirements. A manual tester will be very successful in 
um, you know, testing something that, well, maybe that's not a good example. Uh, let's just take um, 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 a system architect who is not a coder. He's going to be very effective in writing many, many, many PowerPoint decks uh, discussing some, um, you know, orphan architecture that has never been tested. They, they will be very low, um, very local optimized, and their stories in the backlog would be very specific to their jobs. Now, look at the right hand side, you have a feature team. Each team here can touch all of the components. So, at any point in time, any team can take any of the items, one through three, um, and actually get it to done. So that means each team works in order of priority from a standpoint of a, from a product owner or a paying customer. So item number four is not being touched. So each team, and of course, in a large scale scrum, this is the key concept, one of the key things. Every team is almost a clone of another team and they can pick up any work item from a backlog. And so if team Shu falls ill, got to bed because of COVID virus, then team Wu and team Wei I would be able to work in that order one through three because they are complement. So it's like team, seal team six three times. Okay. So of course it's just uh, you know fly by explaining and you know trying to describe what local optimization is, but we do much more deeper dives in uh, when we discuss uh, feature teams versus component teams, system dynamics. And by the way, system modeling, system dynamics, and understanding the whole picture is a huge part of learning less. And we spend a lot of time in training and, and coaching in class, uh, in classrooms and on site with clients and with, with, with companies teaching local, uh, teaching system modeling, modeling system thinking. Right, so I'm gonna pause now because I think that I came to the tail end of my slides. I think I budgeted exactly for how long it took. Uh, the next thing is there have, I have some slides in the back which you probably can pass at your own pace. Um, I don't have anything else prepared for you at the moment. I am going to open up the floor to some questions and I will just mention something that may be appropriate if you are obviously if you're interested in learning less in depth, you a should definitely visit. Let me actually flip over to to the original source of knowledge here, right? So let me just give you one second, and I will do the need it. All right, so you definitely want to bookmark this. You want to bookmark this uh, website. Uh, it's less that work site. It's uh, almost Encyclopedia Britannica from a standpoint of knowledge base. It's got everything you need to know about less. It's got so many case studies from various companies that have adopted less financial uh, fintech, uh, investment banking, uh, insurance companies, telecom companies, product companies, you name it. It has tons of resources, graphics, uh, various communities globally, you know. Um, Lucano's, uh, I run um, a few very large communities globally. Large scale scrum is of New York City is the biggest uh, community in the world. The first one and the biggest, almost 3,000 people. Um, that's probably uh, something I would strongly recommend. Also, definitely read the books. There are three books written, and I mentioned those, and they're available on Amazon, in, in Kindle, in, in as a hard copy. Gr a great resource to learn at your own pace um, and you know at your own leisure right uh, and one more thing of course so you can you know, i have on my own site i have a lot of information about less um captured in various ways so if you just search here for less uh you're gonna come up with a lot of uh rough uh reference and content uh or you can just go through the categories there you have a i have a select category and you can pick less and so there's lots of so there's a lot of uh, genuine and not sponsored when i stress non-sponsored meaning we don't have a marketing machine to promote less it is mostly from uh coaches trainers um early adapters and practitioners people from the trenches so when you get that case study it's not a sponsored case study it is uh, written by a, a person who spent uh many months more than a year oftentimes with a company um discovering and experimenting 
And of course, if you're interested in more structured learning, uh, even today, even though we have uh, you know social distancing problem here, <laughs> we have to watch. We have virtual training going. So the one-day classes, I'm definitely inviting inviting you to mine. They're here, but also they're listed on the less.work site. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause here and uh, open up the floor, guys. Uh, Luca, whatever whichever way you you typically do it, uh, people may submit in chat to you and you uh, share it with me, or people just can ask, unmute themselves and ask. I think people should uh, just unmute themselves and ask. I see only one question in the in the chat box, but I'm pretty sure, sure that, uh, there are more people that uh, would like to address. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be happy to take questions. All right. So, Yuvin, would you like to ask uh, to ask a question that you posted to the chat room? Uh, well, should I use? It? Yes. Um, so, my my question is: uh, Do you feel like, especially in very large organizations, there it's usually over resourced and under skilled? At least from my perspective, I've seen this to be very obvious because uh, when you're adapting to agile, because you see that kind of skill set which is very limited. And how do you kind of address that to leadership? Saying, I'm sorry, what, what, so what exactly are we addressing here? Could you please just reframe? Um, we have many resources um, who are actually very underskilled to move into uh, an agile kind of organization, whether it's technical skills or even what I like to call fluff roles that are part of you know, the planning teams or any kind of governance roles within existing processors. Right. Okay. I see, I see, I see what you're saying. So, uh, so my way of saying is this, so uh, where you stand very much depends on where you sit. So if you talk to a senior enough person uh, who, I guess it's also, uh conditional here right so in the end if you have like you said if you have too many fluff people these people cost money right they produce not so much value but they cost money uh in a good year in a good year that's probably okay in a bad year or in a bad if there are a few years in a row we may see uh, a serious crisis. so that's how we end up having people being laid off in 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 batches because uh an organization has accumulated this unnecessary body weight and now some dramatic cataclysmic events are taking place and they have to let me it just doesn't look good those organizations are really really hurt themselves by doing this reputation is one of those things uh so the way i would address it of course you can make your organization to begin with leaner and more resilient, more resistant to these adverse situations, the, these adverse conditions by uh, practicing uh, lean, by making their organizational structure simpler, more lean. And of course, if there are ad any adverse effects, uh, um, impact is out there, that it will be less impactful on, the, on, on such organization. Now, of course, um, it also has to do with who you talk to within the organization. If you are not talking to a real um so if you're talking to if you i would argue if you talk to a real business person if you talk to a someone with a capitalistic view with a budget to spend on those people they would care i have synthesized i have uh, synthesized this for me for myself as follows um people that you really want to talk to that care are either company owners if it's a small company uh venture capitalists if it's a bigger company or stockholders if it's a very large publicly traded company <laughs> because those are the three kinds of people that actually invest their own money right uh, but of course in a large organization you know i'm this maybe i'm stretching it in a large organization if you go high enough um you can uh, you could probably find people that really care about minimizing existing dysfunctions now it is not as easy to do as it as it's easy to say uh, by but by, by being able to develop your own system thinking and 
when I system thinking, I'm, all, I'm actually referring to one very powerful technique. It's called causal looping, causal loop diagrams. We, we, we spend a lot of time in less training teaching this um, way of, 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 of modeling the system. You can actually make a very um, powerful uh, impact on an organizational um, and an organizational leader and an organization manager by you know, there's so much static noise in the background. I'm not sure why this is the case. So I would, I would, I would, I would consider, I would consider uh, studying and learning system thinking and being able to become more powerful um, facilitator. So when you come uh, up against, when you go up against a senior manager, and by the way, in large scale scrum, we don't use the term leader at all. We use the word uh, manager. I just, I'm just. This is not a less specific question, so I'm using the word leader. Leaders, in order to be called a leader, um, if someone has to deserve it, right? If you want to run, if you if you're re uh, willing to chase uh, to follow someone out of the burning building when there's a fire, most likely they're a leader. Someone who just uh, assigns bonuses at the end of the year or assigns tasks on, on gives you orders, they're not a leader. It doesn't matter what their pay grade is. They're usually less, they're just a senior manager. So in any case, you have to look for those people that are willing to take responsibility for those uh, financial, um, for that financial impact that may be caused by having too many uh, fluff people as you refer to them. Uh, I, I have, I'm kind of digressed a little bit, but I hopefully I covered at least some of your uh, oh, these, are, these are very, very valuable points, Gene. And uh, just to add on, Right, yeah, it's very important the person that you're talking to, but it's uh, as equal important to show the fact that those people are actually fluff people. And one of the ways that you can you can do this is by leading by example, meaning that you'll have to formulate the structure of the team and take responsibility for delivering something without the support or the involvement of the so-called fluff people and this is one of the powerful ways to showing and making visible to senior management that you actually don't need the additional staff but it's also a dangerous approach because you have to take responsibility and you actually have to deliver on it yeah thanks guys yeah, system modeling is is a good exact is, is a good technique to, um, uh, to, to 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 empower yourself to make this uh, into a salient and strong point to to a senior manager. Here's an example of let me show you uh, what I mean by system modeling because for many people it's not obvious. Uh, just uh, let me take a look at one of the examples of. Um, just give me one second. Yeah. Here's an example of the system modeling exercise. Imagine these people coming together on a whiteboard and modeling the system. We not we don't play games when we when we when we learn less. I'm now playing playing agile games, and I've played them so many in my life. I think some of them are very funny and very good. It's just when we um, study less, we assume that people already have done basic scrum training, learning, and they come after the fact, and they already have all of those uh, interesting games uh, under the belt. So what we end up doing, we're doing lots of system modeling. System modeling actually aligning upstream and downstream system variables that are impact organizational design um, interaction dynamics. All these yellow stickies are system variables. What happens between one variable uh, and another? And we look for uh, cause and effect relationships. And to Lucas' point and, and just answering the, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your name question. Uh, you can uh, systemically show to a senior manager that someone is a fluff person. And if so, then what impact uh, presence of such people has an organizational 
uh, ecosystem and organizational uh, efficiency overall. I mean, um, it's probably easier said than done, but this is, this is a very powerful way to unpack unpack uh, some of the internal dynamics. Like each one of these um, yellow stickies has an impact upstream or has a downstream impact on something else. Is it a positive or negative? Is it delayed or immediate? Is it dramatic or regular? Um, and of course, by modeling the system, you're unpacking some invisible things. And if you do it with a senior manager in the room, in fact, together in, the, in front of whiteboard, um, they learn by discovering as opposed to by being told by you. And that sticks to them because now they don't rent from you, they own their own idea, they, they understand it. So just uh, something to think about it. If you ever want to um, read about system thinking, system that dynamics, you um, you know you want to read Peter Sanch's book, The Fifth Discipline. Also, it's great if you like beer. Yeah, we, we teach uh, this, uh, and a lot of FinTech companies has uh, have uh, invited um, uh, the idea of learning less simply because uh, they're probably one of the heaviest ones, right? You know, they have so much baggage they have uh, have acquired over time. So they need to they need to think of ways to unload it, to unpack it. Anyway, so that was the question, and uh, pretty we kind of took a long way to answer it. Uh, any other questions, folks? Yeah. So next one would be Cecilio. Uh, and his question is, how do you see agile transformation in the healthcare world? In the healthcare world? I, I, so I, I really don't want to speculate. I, I don't want to, um, not, 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 the, not the right word. I don't want to discriminate um, against any specific industry. In fact, uh, I, I usually don't talk about my clients, but I, at the moment I am supporting a client from, um, um, you can call it a healthcare slash pharmaceutical, and they're very keen in uh, they very keen on uh, becoming more adaptive, more agile. So first of all, let me say this: if you want to understand the the meaning of the word agile, and I'm sure you guys do, but so many people don't, explaining things are is much easier. Uh, going back to the history, um, and this is something that I was told secondhand because I was not in Snowbird, Utah. In 2001, when our we call them tier one guys from in my community, the Agile Manifesto co-signers got together. The first uh, the, the 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 first candidate to describe today what's called today is, is what's what's called Agile today was the word adaptive, and um, it's synonymous with the word Agile. It's just not as uh, confusing for many people. The word Agile is not the layman term. So the reason why I'm saying this is because um, I can't imagine an organization not wanting to be adaptive, uh, light-footed, uh, lift, you know, responsive, being able to respond to change quickly. So I don't think uh, necessarily a healthcare company is anywhere different. They clearly they have, I know some examples, they have clearly defined products, which is great, or less product development. Uh, they have external clients, which is great, because those clients pay real money. Of course, they have technology departments, and that means we can build less product rooms. I, I don't see any any I don't see any difference between a fintech company. I mean, of course, there is a difference in organizational design and some of the um, historical semantics of any company, but there are no in no in any in no way they are very unique. Of course, if we take an example of a product company that develops a product, it would be. Um, probably even more common sense, right? It would be more natural. Oh, well, well, if you develop a product, like a software product, then of course, less could be a great way for you, for you to do your work. But at the same time, at the same time, other companies, other industries could be also very uh, receptive to the idea of, of less, uh, but also in, of agility in general. Put it this way, if you want to stay uh, relevant, if you want to stay competitive, you cannot rely on organizational design of the 20th century. It just won't work. Things are changing. We already see things are changing as we speak daily. I mean, look, I can tell you one thing, and uh, more often than not, lately I hear from larger organizations 
heavy organizations that have been using other heavy monolithic, very commercially successful for their, or for some people, uh, uh, frameworks, they are, uh, people are really struggling and complaining because uh, those organizations have so much, have accumulated so much waste that probably it was okay to handle when they were all in their respective buildings on um, on their respective um, physical sites. But now everyone everyone is virtual. How do you translate the complexity of communication that can happen within a building between people running around talking to each other? John, tell Joe, tell Jamie, tell Jesse uh, into a virtual reality when you got you know you have to do things much quicker, much leaner. So I, I hear that these companies are more challenged than uh, companies that are inherently and historically leaner and simpler. Not even less company, not even less uh, practicing companies, just simpler and leaner companies. Now, of course, since large scale Scrum is an organizational design framework that calls for organizational descaling, simplification, flattening, uh, those organizations that got, are going to consider less. And like I said, less isn't a super popular thing, but it may become more popular and more, um, uh, more, more, more known just because it is a better way to um, sustain uh, agility and, and internal organizational health. Okay, so not not by choice, but by necessity, if you will. That's my that, that's my personal forecast. Right. Any other questions, folks? So we have another question from Anthony. How many how many coaches should a regular eight team less project have? In like how many coaches is the is the question is how many coaches? Okay. Um, I I can tell you one thing. Um, I'll, I'll, let's use the maximum number of eight teams, right? Uh, in order to change, so first of all, it doesn't take that many coaches in general to change um, organizational, to make organizational improvements. It takes a few seasoned senior people, well versed, to be influential enough while interfacing with senior management. Because real decisions, organizational design decisions, are being made by internal people, not by coaches. In, in, yes, influence comes from, from people that, you know, are coaches and organizational design consultants will call themselves. However, it doesn't take that many in general. Now, for large-scale Scrum adoption, I can speak of my experience, right? I have some uh, technical background, uh, but not uh, technical. I, I was not technical enough to cover some of the aspects of less adoption that is very critical. You know, we very much uh we've uh, very much focused on technical excellence so my in, in my experiment in my experience i had a colleague um who was very senior technical person so we both were strong supporters of scrum and less and we were well uh, well aware of it with past experience we're two wingmen doing this together and we had up to five teams ultimately not eight five teams working on the wider defined product at one point in our case, now we had a few uh, very seasoned scrum masters, some of which, some of whom we actually coached to that point, and then we uh, let them loose. And uh, like for, for any uh, for any for any professional coach, uh, there should be a goal to coach themselves out of the job eventually. If there is no such goal exists, it means there is a transactional business going on, and the coach is very happy um, because of that codependency with the client which is, by the way, a big challenge for internal coaches because many of them just are not coaches. They are just uh, internal uh, employees that just use the label of a coach to describe what they do. But that's just a side note. So the short answer is it could vary. It could be, you know, for for fully blown less adoption up to eight teams, 70 plus minus people, maybe two, maybe three coaches, you know, maybe two, maybe one coach. If, if someone is like Craig Larman himself, who is, very well versed uh, technologically, and also he's obviously he's who know who would know who who would know less better than him. 
then maybe that would hit, would, be, would be sufficient, although he's also human, and I'm sure he's going to look immediately, as soon as he would engage, he would look for help internally. So the short answer is you want a few senior um, experienced people coming in and uh, helping you at least with the first um, period of that journey, uh, a few months of prep, prep work before you flip your switch and you have teams start to start sprinting. We actually covered the whole dynamic of it, even in basic uh, less training. In fact, um, I have a class running you know, today, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And uh, today we spent actually more than I budgeted for just to talk about um, how the actual prep work and flipping the switch takes place. Uh, so that requires a much deeper uh, dive uh, conversation. But yeah, you, you need a few people probably. Also, maybe you need a dedicated person who will work closely with senior management, may, which may require skill. Like working at team level with teams and individuals uh, is, is, is also is a very, requires a lot of skills, but you may probably uh, find someone internally, like a seasoned scrum master who is there already, may potentially pick it up very soon. But work, working with senior leverage, uh, managers, like uh, senior vice presidents, uh, depending on what company you're in, or uh, managing director, CTO level, you probably need someone who comes from outside who can deliver these powerful, um, sometimes uncomfortable messages, right? So. All right. Uh, next question is from Perla. Uh, I'm going to rephrase it a bit. So, um, what uh, communication techniques do you usually recommend, especially when uh, dealing with uh, unpopular messages? Well, I'm sorry, dealing with who? With unpopular messages. So unpopular messages. Oh, so I love using causal loop diagrams. Let me let me show you one of mine. Um, this is just an example. Um, so a picture is a thousand words. Yeah, I think you already know it from seeing my cartoons, right? Uh, I like showing a cartoon and give a story. I don't like, uh, you know, dense decks with too many words. But uh, let me uh, give you a, here an example. Here's an example of um, system model, causal loop diagram that m contains a lot of uncommon mess uh, uncomfortable messages. Here's one about command and control behavior through system modeling. So. I could probably just send across, but I, I don't, this is not something you create on your own and then share. This is not the goal. This is just something I did because I really wanted to explore this idea on my own. However, you can either take this as a cheat sheet and sit down in front of a senior manager and have them with you model the system about some unpopular discussions. Why is there a manifestation of command and control behavior from managers? And you start figuring out why. Uh, there's a legend up here what you know tells you what means what, which annotation means what, like misunderstanding of roles of others, job insecurity, worries, worries about his own career path. You start managing, uh, you, start, you start exposing these challenges. And some of these are very un unpopular messages. So I picture the thousand words. And so instead of you know writing a long email or, or giving a speech that may come back and smack you. You just have a you know system modeling conversation, and this is something actually we explicitly learned in less, because as you notice, so these are my you know nice and neat, but uh, if you look at all of these images, right, the, this is this is many one of thousands that we have done, I mean thousands because in each class we do a lot, but we invite people, we encourage people once they go back to their workplace, to start experimenting with this with their colleagues. Not to start selling the idea of less, 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 let's implement less. That would almost never fly. I never lead off explicitly by saying, let's uh, adapt less. We build people up. We build up their understanding. We make them realize what's happening organizationally, systemically. Once they're ready, once they have these aha moments, I say, oh, by the way, what we just described, what we just talked about is a uh, large scale scrum. So that's my way of doing it. Right. And you can probably. Uh, <laughs> yep. Is, What's that? 
the next one from Rajesh. Um, can a single product owner become a bottleneck? Can a single product owner become a bottleneck? Of course. Yeah, any person can become a bottleneck. Uh, you know, five people can become a bottleneck if they go on and on, on, on strike. A single product owner in large scale scrum could be as big of a bottleneck as a product, a single product owner per. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. I think I misspoke. A single product owner for eight teams in less, if that's what's in, in implied, could become a bottleneck if he or she becomes ill or gets um, or gets um, you know removed for some reason, as much as um, a, a product owner being removed from a single scrum team if there's one-to-one -one ratio. So anytime you lose a person, it may create a bottleneck. However, however, in large-scale scrum, we clearly delineate between two things, prioritization and clarification. Prioritization flows through a product owner. So from that perspective, we minimize what this person is responsible for. We don't make this person uh, do stuff that is not product ownership, product ownership in nature, meaning he or she does not move your tickets. He or she does not write stories in volumes. He or she does not give clarifications. He or she is not neck deep in every conversation. We recommend conversations about clarification to flow as much as possible through uh, stakeholders and users. In that regard, we dramatically minimize the, the chances and risks of a product owner becoming um, a bottleneck on the normal conditions, unless this person obviously got, got ill or, you know, maybe on maternity leave, in which case, you know, there's got to be a backup temporarily. And if it's a, if it's a, a permanent solution that needs to be found, then another product owner needs to be found. But it's not something that we would expect happening daily or every sprint in terms of, oh, can this person really handle up to eight teams? Yes, they can because of proper dynamics that we establish and because of uh, establishing the proper flow of information from customers and users onto teams directly, not through multiple translation layers, we can achieve that. We can give a person his or her life back, a product owner that is, so they don't have to have three, you know, two or three jobs for the same paycheck. All right. Uh, right. One from Rajesh as well. Um, do you recommend any, what agile tools do you recommend for less? Large scale Scrum strongly recommends being either tool free or being super light on tooling. Specifically, uh, if it's all virtual, I'm sorry, if it's, if, if, if everyone is collocated and hopefully we'll be back to normal soon, then, um, we recommend, um, we, we definitely recommend separating um, media, uh, using different media for product backlog and a sprint backlog. Each team has their own sprint backlog, not a, not a product, not a team private backlog, but a sprint backlog. So we recommend either just a whiteboard if it's all collocated, or if it's absolutely necessary, use something as simple as Google Sheets or Excel document. Do not get intoxicated and con and with convoluted electronic tools. I mean, I, I'm sure someone's going to try it anyway, but I may almost assure you that you will find it challenging and, and cumbersome. Just because less does not work within a tool, there's nothing wrong with less, or maybe there's something that could be wrong, but not because of the tool. So you may create um, unnecessary uh, overhead and, and, and friction that is gonna be very costly and frustrating. You know, any any tool that has the word tool agile in it is anti-agile by definition. Right. And I think one of my slides talked about that, right? Right. If you see those tool-centric, uh heavy framework centric approaches, this is uh the triple constraint, right? The tr the, the triple taxation that costs thousands and thousands of dollars. If you absolutely have to use some digital aid. Just use Google Spreadsheet. It could do a phenomenal thing. You, you can even build you build build uh, build your metric, metrics if you would like. And related to the same question, 
What's your what's your view, Gene, on Slack or Microsoft Teams for uh, team communication when dealing with remote teams? I'm sorry, could, uh, something about Slack. Could you repeat that one more time, please? So what's your view on using Slack or Microsoft Teams for team communication, especially when dealing with remote teams? Absolutely. Great approach. Slack is an amazing thing. I actually did not like it until recently. I mean, recently, a few, like almost a year ago. I didn't like it because I was confused with different channels. But now I have my personal Slack channel, as a matter of fact. And I invite you guys all to join it for free. You know, I, I, every student that comes out of my class gets immediate free access to my Slack channel. I, I don't care. I built communities through those venues. So I have a Slack uh, workspace. And, um, you know, I, I think it's an amazing media to, to exchange. Zoom, Slack, and Mirrorboard. Here's an example. Let me give you a sneak peek of another great collaboration tool. Um, I use it for training daily. Um, here's an example of a my oh, I should have used that to show you something. So uh, not, not, there's nothing proprietary here. This is a current class that's happening yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This is our mind map, a bunch of questions that people have submitted that I need to look at today. And here is the, um, uh, so is a certified, so this is the, this is today's exercise in the room. I'm showing you for two reasons. A, to, to show you what a system model looks by people in class, but also could be the same thing you do um, in your, um, at work with your colleagues virtually, but also the tool itself. Mirrorboard is a great virtual collaboration tool. There's also Mural, another tool, great tool. There's Nurira Span is yet another tool. So those are great ways to beef up your uh, virtual collaboration needs, for sure. I'm all for Slack. And I uh, invite you all to my, here's my Slack channel. If you can share all details, uh, if you can. Uh, uh, yeah, we can share them. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to share it. Yeah, I'll share it with the group. Uh, yep. All right. Another question from uh, Jorge, how, how do you enable, uh, actually, how do you work with stakeholders that uh, resist the change, basically, they, they resist the implementation of the LESS framework or Agile framework? So I, I really can't associate with the, with the situation as much because you know, a stakeholder who is, I mean, I can't imagine someone being explicitly resistant to less. It's not like they have hatred for less. They should not even know what it is. They should know only one thing. Stakeholders should know one thing, as far as I'm concerned, until they're ready to know, to know more. Their time and effort is required to provide clarifications to development teams when needed. Full stop. Don't, don't, don't overwhelm them with terminology and semantics and logistics of a framework, especially, so less is lean and simple as is, but even then, I would say introduce those basic rules and principles only when they are ready. Don't overwhelm them. If people are just implicitly resistant to, to collaborate with their colleagues, like from technology, that has nothing to do with less. It just means that you're just not willing. So that's a, could be somewhere between a uh, personal problem to a job problem to maybe they really maybe don't have enough time. It's a senior management problem becomes now to find people that are um, dedicated and willing to engage and, uh, and, and they need to see value in what they're doing. So if someone is being asked to do two jobs for the same paycheck, of, of course they're going to be very resistant. 